yesterday afternoon we went and we helped somebody stack some firewood uh, in the afternoon and there was a gentleman that, that uh, liked antiques and he had some neat antiques in his house that Josiah and I were admiring. And one of the things he had was an ice box. Remember, I don't know, I don't remember an ice box, but I've heard of them. Before refrigerators, people used ice houses to preserve their food. Um, and they had to get, if you had an ice box to preserve your food, you had to get the ice from somewhere and you would get the ice from the ice house. Ice houses were very common in Maine. Uh, they had thick walls, no windows, and a very tightly fitted door. In the winter, when the rivers and the lakes would freeze, people would go out and cut out these huge blocks of ice and remove them from the water and bring them to these ice houses and they would pack them in there tightly uh, with lots of sawdust. There'd be sawdust all around them, insulating them. And very often the ice would last all the way till summer. Well, once there was a man who lost a very valuable watch while he was working in an ice house. He searched for it diligently. He searched for it carefully. He searched all over the ice house, trying to paw through the sawdust to find this valuable watch. His fellow workers also looked. They looked all over the place. They made a great commotion trying to find this watch. But their efforts really didn't pan out. They didn't find the watch. They happened to be a, a, small bot, a small boy standing by and he asked them what they were doing and they told him how they were, had looked for this watch and they never found it. Well, uh, the little boy went into the ice house and at lunchtime while the, all the ice workers were taking a break, he went in there all by himself. He shut the door. And a few minutes later, he came out with a watch. And all the men were amazed. How did you find that watch? And he said it was like this. I went in. I closed the door. I laid down in the sawdust. I kept very still. And soon I heard the watch ticking. Too often, we don't hear God when he is speaking to us. Because we don't listen long. Well. We're so busy with the doing that we don't pause for the listening. How many of you have ever thought, I really want to know what God wants me to do? Sometimes we have to make decisions in life. Sometimes they're small decisions. Sometimes they're big decisions. And, and for Christians, you don't know, we love the Lord. We want to do what he wants us to do. We want to be obedient but yet we're still uncertain how to proceed. We have this desire to hear the voice of God speaking into our lives. And sometimes, the truth is, sometimes he's clearly speaking to us and we don't recognize uh, that he's speaking to us. And other times we're straining to hear his voice, but he wants us to wait. He isn't quite ready, ready to reveal uh, his will to us yet. Today's story is about an old man and a young boy. The old man knew God, but struggled with obedience. The child didn't really know God yet, but was being obedient in what he did know. In the end, it's a story about a child who trusts God enough to do something uncomfortable, and an old man who doesn't trust him enough to do what's uncomfortable. If you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 3. 1 Samuel chapter 3. Beginning with verse 1. Now Samuel was serving the Lord under Eli. The Lord's word was rare at that time, and visions weren't widely known. One day Eli, whose eyes had grown so weak he was unable to see, was laying down in his room. God's lamp hadn't gone out yet, and Samuel was lying down in the Lord's temple. 
where God's chest was. The Lord called to Samuel. I'm here, he said. Samuel hurried to Eli. And he said, I'm here, you called me? I didn't call you, Eli replied. Go lay down. So he did. Again, the Lord called to Samuel. So Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, I'm here, you called me? I didn't call you, my son, Eli replied. Go and lie down. Now, Samuel didn't yet know the Lord, and the Lord's word hadn't yet been revealed to him. A third time, the Lord called to Samuel. He got up and went to Eli and said, I'm here, you called me? Then, Eli realized that it was the Lord who was calling to the boy. So Eli said to Samuel, go and lie down, and if he calls you, Say, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down where he'd been. Then the Lord came and stood there, calling just as before, Samuel, Samuel. Samuel said, speak, your servant is listening. And the Lord said to Samuel, I am about to do something in Israel that will make the ears of all who hear it tingle. On that day I will bring to pass against Eli, everything I said about his household, every last little bit. I told him that I would punish his family forever because of the wrongdoing he knew about, how his sons were cursing God, but he wouldn't stop them. Because of that, I swore about Eli's household that his family's wrongdoing would never be reconciled by sacrifice or by offering. Samuel lay there until morning, then opened the doors of the Lord's house. Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli. But Eli called Samuel, saying, Samuel, my son, I'm here, Samuel said. What did he say to you? Eli asked. Don't hide anything from me. May God deal harshly with you, and worse still, if you hide from me a single word from everything he said to you. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. He is the Lord, Eli said. He will do as he pleases. So Samuel grew up, and the Lord was with him, not allowing any of his words to fail. All Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, knew that Samuel was trustworthy as the Lord's prophet. And the Lord continued to appear at Shiloh because the Lord had revealed himself to Samuel at Shiloh through the Lord's word. It's this amazing story. And yes, there's some backstory to, to where we pick up. But So let's start off with who is Eli? Well, first of all, Eli was the leader of Israel and he was a judge. Between the time of of Moses in the time of King Saul, between the time when the Israelites came out of Egypt to the time where they got their first king, they were led by judges. There were leaders who uh, were both priest and leader. They were a mediator between God and the people. And they were meant to help the people to, to see God's will, hear God's will, and be obedient. That was their, their job, their role. Some did better at it than others. Eli happened to be the second to the last judge. He was a high priest. Now at the time, the Israel, this is long before the, the temple was built. And so they worshiped the Lord in uh, what you might call the tent of meeting. It was essentially a temporary mobile temple. I remember when I was a kid, I used to watch uh, MASH. And MASH stood for Mobile Army Surgical Hospital. Well, the, the temple where Eli and Samuel are serving in this story is basically like mobile God's temple. Um, it's ten, a series of tents. In the middle was the Holy of Holies. And in the, at the Holy of Holies is where the Ark of the Covenant 
It was this ark that God had given them very specific instructions to build and inside it they placed the Ten Commandments and, and uh, a sample of the manna God had used to feed them in the desert. And they saw this area of the temple as the place where God dwelt. And so to serve in the temple was, was this very special thing. Certainly to be the leader, the high priest of Israel, the judge of Israel, was a special thing. Now, Eli knew God. Eli had been used by God. Eli had served God. But his sons, who were also priests, and remember, it mentions here that Eli was getting so he couldn't see anymore. He was in charge, but he had given a lot of the priestly duties to his sons. And his sons were out of control. I mean, they were out of control. They were, when people would come and bring their sacrifices, before they sacrificed the animal, that they would take all the best cuts of meat for themselves. You might equate it to uh, somebody taking the largest bills out of the offering plate for themselves. They were stealing from God and his people. And I don't know if it's fair to say this is better or worse, but they were, uh, they were carrying on affairs with the women who, who were at the entrance of the temple. They were sleeping with the temple servants. Eli knew his sons were doing these things. He knew about these, their behavior. In fact, in a previous uh, story we didn't read, God sent a messenger to Eli with a, a prophecy that he needed to stop his sons from doing this or there were going to be consequences. Eli knew of his son's behavior, and it must have been uncomfortable for Eli to hear how wicked his sons were acting. They were priests. They were supposed to be mediating between the people and God, and yet they were a train wreck. They were awful. He warned them that they were sinning against God himself, and then that was the end of it. He didn't do anything to put a stop to their behavior. God warned Eli that because of his family, he would lose both his sons on the same day and his surviving family would become beggars. He warned him that he himself would be replaced by a faithful priest who would anoint kings. And remember, God said that at a time when Israel had never had a king. Sadly, ultimately, that prophecy did come true. Eventually, uh, both of Eli's sons died in a battle against the Philistines. And not only did they die in battle, but the Philistines captured and took away the Ark of the Covenant. When Eli heard the news that not only his, had his sons died, but when he heard that they had, the Philistines had taken away the Ark, Eli fell over backwards and broke his neck and died. The prophecy was fulfilled. Samuel, the little boy Samuel, would become the judge of Israel following Eli. In fact, he would be the last judge. Samuel became a judge and he led Israel before anointing Saul and then King David as the first kings of Israel. So that's who Eli is. A man who had some faith, who knew God, and yet was afraid to deal with something uncomfortable and let sin uh, run rampant among the people he was protecting. Who's Samuel, this little boy? Well, there's more to his story. Samuel was, Samuel was born uh, through a miracle. Samuel's mother, Hannah, was, was barren. She wasn't able to have children. Um, she was picked on and harassed for not being, able to have two, not being able to have children. And she went to the temple and she prayed that God would give her a son. 
she actually met Eli. And uh, at first he thought she was drunk and then realized, no, she's just passionately praying to God. And he blessed her. And more importantly, God blessed her. And she gave birth to a son. And it was a miracle. And she was so thankful that uh, she dedicated her son with a special vow called the Nazarite vow. Uh, the Nazarite vow was pretty much three things. The Nazarite vow consisted of don't drink alcohol or don't drink alcohol from grape juice or from grapes. Cut, don't cut your hair and don't touch a dead body. Ironic, and so keep in mind that this little boy who took the Nazarite vow, she brought him to the temple. She brought him to Eli and said, I'm offering my son to God that he would be raised to serve the Lord in the temple. That was quite an amazing thing to pray for something so special, to have God give it to her and then to give that child back to God. And uh, God blessed her. And she had other children. Eli grew up, uh, excuse me, Samuel grew up with Eli. And Samuel was, was a Nazarite. It's, I find it amusing that Samuel would become uh, a, a uh, judge, briefly a judge of Israel. And he was not the first Israelite judge to be a Nazarite. Um, there was another judge who was a Nazarite. You can read his story uh, in the book of Judges. Samuel was a judge. Samuel was a Nazarite. Don't drink, don't cut your hair, don't uh, touch a dead body. You read Samuel's story all the way through and he gets drunk, he, uh, his girlfriend cuts his hair and he's killing the, what's up? What did I say? Oh, Samuel. Samuel, Samson, too many names. Yeah, so Samson, yes. He's, he's a warrior killing people, touching, therefore touching dead bodies. He's, he, uh, it didn't go so well for him, and it didn't end well in the end, but that's Samson's story. Um, for Samuel, he was brought to the temple as a toddler. He served Eli. In verse 1, it says the Lord's word was rare at that time, and visions were not widely known. And I'm sure the people at that time, just like us, we want to know God. We want to hear his voice. You know, in the Bible, God speaks through dreams and visions and prophets. Some hear his audible voice. Others he speaks to through, through angels and miracles. Now Israel was at a time where God's voice was rarely heard. In the past, people like Adam and Noah, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, Joseph and Moses, and the whole nation of Israel heard the voice of God speaking. Now when Eli is leading the nation, it has become rare to hear God. Why? Did God suddenly leave them on their own? Did God care about them? Well, of course he did. Why weren't they hearing God's voice? There's three options. Maybe the word of the Lord was rare because God had already told them what he wanted of them. And he wanted them to trust him and be faithful with what they already knew. That's possible. Another possibility is the word of the Lord was rare because sin was abundant in the life of the people. We certainly know Eli's sons were, were sinning and people were letting them get away with it. Or three, maybe the, the Lord of the word was rare because God was speaking, but no one was listening until a young boy heard God's voice and got out of bed. Now, Samuel was a, a young boy. He was about 11 years old. And in verse 7, it tells us that he knew of God, but he didn't yet know God. That sounds so familiar. It's not all that different for many of us growing up. 
Samuel learned about God growing up. He helped in the temple. And I'm sure he heard the stories of his ancestors and their journey in and out of slavery in Egypt. I'm sure he heard how God led the people during uh, the era of the judges. He heard all the old stories of God and his people, I'm sure. And quite honestly, that sounds a bit like Sunday school. Except they were in a temple and the animal sacrifices, but we don't need to get into that. But yeah, it was a little like Sunday school. Samuel was learning about God, moving towards that point where he would get to know God. And there is a difference between knowing about God and knowing God. We too are in a modern age, and, or we too in the modern age need to do more then learn about God. We need to get to know him. You know, yeah, we need to get to know him. There, there are people in this world we know of, but we don't know them. I'm sure you have conversations all the time where somebody will say, do you know so-and-so? And they'll say, well, I know of them. In other words, you've heard the name, you might have seen the face, you might know who they are. You might know a couple things about what they do for a living. But you don't have a friendship. You don't have a relationship. You don't know them yet. It's good to learn about God, but it's better to get to know God. And the truth is God still speaks to his people. In Hebrews, uh, chapter 1, verse 1 of Hebrews, it says, In the past, God spoke through the prophets to our ancestors in many times and many ways. In these final days, though, he spoke to us through a son. God made his son the heir of everything and created the world through him. We have this advantage of living in the final days. God has revealed himself. God has spoken to us through his son, Jesus. Do you want to get to know God? He has revealed himself in Jesus. Do you want to know God? Try this. Pray, read the Bible, go to church, pray, read the Bible, go to church, pray, read the Bible, go to church. There's a pattern there. And as we follow that pattern, we give God opportunities to speak into our lives. <clears throat> we give God the opportunity to speak to our hearts in that still, quiet voice of the Holy Spirit. Too often we don't hear God because we are focused on all the wrong things to the point of being distracted from what God is doing. Have we become so distracted by what the world is doing that we've lost sight of what God is doing? Eli knew God, but was more interested in religion than relationship. He liked being the high priest. He liked being the judge. Seems like he really, really loved the Ark of the Covenant, perhaps more than he loved the God who had uh, gifted it to them. Eli was a, a judge, a high priest. For years he cared about, he cared for the tabernacle. He loved the Ark of the Covenant that was in the tabernacle. He attended to sacrifices and priestly duties, and he was more focused on the power of the ark than on the God who gave it to him. And here's the thing. I find it hard to believe that Eli got to that position as a judge and a priest without getting to know God or hear his voice. Somewhere along Eli's journey, God's voice became drowned out by his own busyness, his pride, his priorities, his disobedience. But then there was a little boy named Samuel. There were three very simple things that, made, that Samuel did. But when you think about it, it's amazing. Here's the first thing amazing about Samuel. That little boy was available. He heard a voice and he popped out of bed and said, here I am, Lord. Now, at first, he wasn't, he didn't understand that it was God talking to him. 
but he did know that he served in the temple and Eli was the, the, the high priest. So when he heard a voice in the middle of the night, he thought Eli was the only one, other one there, so he went and woke up Eli. His response was just to be obedient, jump out of bed and say, here I am. Samuel was, uh, was living in the temple. He was learning about how God had led his people. And Samuel had an attitude of submission to serving God, even if he didn't quite understand it all yet. Samuel was available. Samuel was listening. After Eli told him that it was God speaking to him, when, when Samuel heard God's voice, he said, Here I am, Lord. And he said, your servant is listening. Once Eli told Samuel that it was God speaking to him, he listened. Samuel wasn't busy with activities. He wasn't surrounded by people. He was alone in the quiet waiting for the Lord to speak to him. Samuel heard God call him by name. Don't you love that? Samuel. Samuel. And he told God, your servant is listening. And he really did listen. So Samuel was available. Samuel was listening for God. And the third thing he did was he was obedient. Samuel not only listened to God, but he followed through with the message God had given him. God gave Samuel a difficult message. And I don't see it in... Certainly, when God gives you a, gives anyone a message, there's somebody that message is for. That message is meant to be shared with someone. And Samuel's message was difficult. The next morning, Samuel went to the high priest of Israel, the judge, the leader of the nation, the one who was raising him, his, his own caregiver. And he told him that God was going to end his family's role as priests and leaders because of their sin. That is a heavy message for a little boy to bring to a mighty leader. The last thing Eli wanted to hear was the message that Samuel had. And Samuel didn't want to be the bearer of such bad news. But Samuel was obedient. God spoke to Samuel. God used this young boy as a prophet. Why did he use a little boy? Because that little boy was available. He was listening and he was obedient. So we have to ask ourselves, are we available? Do we put ourselves in the places where we are likely to hear from God? Are we listening? It's really easy to ramble off our prayer requests and then bury our mind in something else, something else we've got to do. Do we allow even a few quiet moments to hear God's voice? Do we spend even a few moments in God's word? Samuel was obedient. As we seek God's will and listen for his voice, are we obedient in what he has already asked us to do? The Life Application Study Bible makes this note. It says, too often we ask God to control our lives without making us give up the goals for which we strive. We ask God to help us get where we want to go. The first step in correcting this tendency is to turn over both the control and the destination of our lives to him. The second step is to do what we already know God requires of us. And the third step is to listen for further direction from his word, the Bible, God's map for life. I like that. As followers of Jesus, we believe that Jesus spoke to us through the Holy Spirit before we even knew about him. We believe God's provenient grace guided us every step along the way of our relationship with him. We believe it was God's provenient grace that took us from learning about God 
to getting to know him that took us from to the place of salvation and sanctification we believe that it was God who brought us this far do we really think he would bring us this far only to abandon us God is still speaking sometimes he encourages us to keep going Sometimes he simply reminds us that we are loved. Sometimes he shows us way to encourage, ways to encourage others. And sometimes he convicts us when we are veering away from his will. We must learn to listen. We must learn to discern his voice. And I, that's not always easy. When we're looking to discern God's voice, chances are there's, we're going to hear one of three voices. We're either going to hear our own voice, or we're going to hear the devil's voice, or we're going to hear God. Here's a little bit of how to know the difference. If it's your own voice, you're hearing your own voice, will sound like this. Your own voice is going to sound logical analytical because in your mind you're going to rationalize what you already want you're going to rationalize what you want to hear but you might be hearing satan's voice satan always condemns the bible says satan's purpose is to steal and to kill and destroy and so if the thoughts you're hearing are negative or destructive or vicious or accusing it's the enemy but the voice we want to hear in the midst of this world is God's voice. And when God speaks, it always lines up with what he has already revealed to us about himself in the Bible. His character, his actions. He is kind, loving, inspirational, wise, healing, and convicting. And God convicts us without condemning us. God convicts us and offers us help and grace at the same time. Sometimes we get to these points in life where we're faced with decisions. We love Jesus and we want to be obedient, but we're uncertain about what to do next. So we look to the heavens, hoping to hear a powerful, booming voice telling us exactly what to do. We want God to remove our part from the decision. And then when it doesn't work like that, we turn to a brother or sister in Christ and ask, how do I know God's will for my life? Here's how to know God's will for your life. The, the answer often seems too simple. Pray. Ask others to pray with you. Read the Bible regularly. And pay attention to what God is doing in your life. Years ago, a pastor shared with me some some thoughts on where and how to find God's will. If you're searching for God's will about something, first of all, look to Scripture, look to the Bible. What does the Bible say about the decisions in your path? What does the Bible say about your situation? Second, look to the inner witness of the Holy Spirit. Do you sense the Holy Spirit pulling you towards a certain choice? Three, Look to the circumstances of your life. What is God, providence? What is God doing in your life right now? And that, does that give you insight into what he's trying to uh, call you to do? And fourth, the counsel of mature Christians without a vested interest. Go to other Christians. Tell them your dilemma. Ask them to pray with you. We all want to know. We want to hear the voice of God. We want to know his will for his life. And the thing I've come back to over and over again is, is really simple. God's not out to trick us. Believe it or not, God wants us to know how to live in his will. Quite often, he's already revealed everything we need to know for a moment. And we simply need to walk in what we already know where to do. I think it was Oswald Chambers I first read saying, uh, trust God and do the next thing. In other words, trust God and do the next thing you already know you have to do. 
Jesus said in John 10, 27, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. Let me uh, close with a, a short story from Max Lucado's book, Gentle Thunder. Once there was a man who dared God to speak. Burn the bush like you did for Moses, God, and I will follow. Collapse the walls like you did for Joshua, God, and I will fight. Still the waves like you did on Galilee, God, and I will listen. And so the man sat by a bush near a wall close to the sea, and he waited for God to speak. And God heard the man, so God answered. He sent fire not for a bush, but for a church. He brought down a wall not of brick, but of sin. He stilled the storm not of the sea, but of a soul. And God waited for the man to respond. And he waited, and he waited, and he waited. But because the man was looking at, the, at bushes and not hearts, bricks and not lives, seas and not souls, he decided God hadn't done anything. Finally, he looked to God and asked, have you lost your power? And God looked at him and said, have you lost your hearing? God is revealing himself to us. Sometimes through what you might take for granted, his word, his people, his church, in prayer. And yes, other times he will get your attention through the circumstances of your life, through the counsel of other Christians. Sometimes he will just tug at your, at your heart as his Holy Spirit says, I'm taking you this way. The thing is, we must listen. Uh, let's sing one last song. As we Lord God, we want to know you and know you more. Lord, we can. We know you love us. We know that you want us to walk with you in obedience and love. Lord, reveal yourself to us. When we seek you, may we find you. And Lord God, would you help us to tune out whatever distractions long enough to hear your voice speaking to our lives. We are your people. You are our God. And we ask that you would lead us and give us strength as we walk in obedience. Lord, be with us as we gather together as your people and fellowship together. We thank you for the food that we're going to uh, share together. Would you bless that food to, to strengthen our bodies and our fellowship? And Lord, would you uh, be with us? And we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them. They follow me. May you continue to hear the still, quiet voice of the shepherd. And may you follow him all the way home. God bless you and enjoy your afternoon.